Okay. Uh, I think I see most folks. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Bryn. It actually worked out well for all of us, I think. Okay, so okay. Let you um, continue, please. Okay. Um, oh, actually, um, okay, let me, if you could wait a minute, let me just let um, Chair uh, know that we are waiting on her. Sorry. No problem. I, I did want to just flag for the committee that I do need to leave pretty soon um, for the Senate floor. Okay. No, I, thanks. Understand that. Okay. So why don't you, why don't you go ahead? Okay. So um, I know that we sort of ended abruptly there on the new crime. I wasn't sure if there were other questions about that before I moved on to the body cameras portion of the bill. Nope, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Okay. So section six um, adds a requirement to Title 20 that the Department of Public Safety equip all of uh, the Vermont State Police officers with um, body cameras or another recording device. And it requires that that device is recording whenever the um, officer has contact with the public for law enforcement purposes. Um, the associated section is section seven. Um, this is sort of the how is this going to be paid for section. And it provides that DPS should immediately start acquiring these body cameras and using them um, and any ongoing costs that are associated with them. So storage costs, um, any storage costs that can't be accommodated in DPS's budget um, should be included in their FY21 budget proposal um, that is coming in in August of this year. Um, Bryn, I have a question and then I see Tom and Martin. So back in section six, when it talks about the department shall ensure that every department law enforcement officer. So again, we're just talking about DPS we're in this bill. We're not talking about the um, municipalities or- Correct, that's or, correct. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Tom and then Martin. That, that brought up, so and what Maxine was just talking about, department means DPS? Right, okay. right. So this is a- um, yeah, right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Vermont State Police officers. This is a requirement that Vermont State Police be equipped with body cameras um, <clears throat> beginning in August of 2020 of this year. Okay. Um, so uh, starting on line 16 on section six, that the device recording whenever the officer has contact with the public for law enforcement purposes is, is that pulled someplace else? Because I, I'm just gonna go on memory because it was a, uh, a few years ago talking, or first I'll ask, would that be the cameras are on when they're say at a, at a precinct or a uh, police station or, uh, when they're inside? Um, I think that it was intended to, to be pretty broad and encompassing any interaction that law enforcement has um, with a civilian. So I think it could, it could conceivably be in the station, yes. Right, because uh, again, I'm going on memory from a few years ago talking with my son, and, uh, but I, I remember him saying that when they, they get back to the station for whatever reason, their, their body cams are, are turned off and inside. And, and I, I don't know the reason why. Uh, maybe there's plenty of cameras in the station that would cover or something like that. But um, I guess that would go back. Uh, is there, I mean, this is, I'm good. I'm sure your answer is gonna be, I have no idea. <laughs> but is, is our uh, police stations or the, the state police barracks, are, are they cameraed inside that you know? Or, or I guess if, if you don't know, maybe Nader could answer it and, and then I'm done. I have no idea. You were right about my answer. Okay. So um, Bryn, I do see some hands up. Can you, can you, yeah. uh, give a few? okay, great. Um, so let's see, uh, uh, Martin and then Jim, I think that's, and Nader, okay. Yeah. So, so um, I mean, I'm very concerned about uh, all these devices, uh, video recording devices getting out there with all law enforcement without actually a model policy that's been implemented. So can you point, and you don't have to do it right now, but can you point to where, Al, didn't you mention earlier that this is GovOps, Senate GovOps is, is considering this? If you could point to the bill and the provision and 
if it's possible for you to send us what that policy is. I know this is mostly GovOps, but, but there are issues that overlap with uh, judiciary, such as privacy concerns is something that we've really looked closely at. And there are definitely privacy issues with respect to the use of these uh, cameras. Um, so if we could get that information, if, if this is if this seems to be moving at the same time, then I'm fine with it. But but putting a bunch of devices out there with actually without the policy seems to be a bad idea. Uh, absolutely, I can send. I'll send the committee a link to um, the LEAB model policy, um, and also I'll see if there's something that's been posted to Senate GovOps. I believe this this is in the works, like as we speak, um, that they are working on on what, what the policy should be for the use of these body cameras. So I can get that all to the committee as soon as the Senate's off the floor today. Thanks. Yeah, and we, we can also think about, you know, the effective date and if that, you know, helping, if moving the effective date might alleviate some concerns. Uh, okay, let's see. So Jim, not or Barbara. And again, Bryn, let us know when you, when you need to go. Okay, I imagine I have a, a few more minutes. So, Bryn, on the, uh, and I apologize if we got back on late, but um, every law officer in contact with the public. Um, so, for example, uh, a DMV inspector is a law enforcement officer. If they are doing a um, truck check and they're getting underneath the truck, is that, would they have to have the, um, the body camera going? No, so this this would only apply to the Vermont State Police. This require this specific requirement only applies to Vermont State Police. So, and again, I'll just say that the um, language was intended that requirement that it always be on when um, the officer is interacting with a civilian. It was intended to be broad and sort of general with the idea that Senate GovOps was working on the actual policy um, that that may provide some more specificity about when the cameras need to be on. Okay. Um, so moving at the same time, there was some, um, there was quite a bit of conversation about should they dive deeper? Should the Senate dive deeper into when the cameras need to be on? And the decision was made to leave it, leave it broad and general for now um, with the idea that there will be some requirement of or model policy that is imposed uh, by the state. Um, so, so I support the body camera language. I'm just wondering if maybe it references a policy and push the date out uh, until that policy is adopted that the um, the board puts together. Just a, a suggestion based on some of the prior conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I see uh, Barbara Nodder. I don't see your hand anymore, uh, but I see Barbara and then Ken and Nodder. Please correct me if I should be seeing your hair, your hand. And then up, oh, okay, Rob LeClaire and Bryn again, just let us know because <laughs> the questions are coming. Thank you. So Bryn, I think my, I have two, I think quick questions. One is um, to uh, several points that have been made already. There's been reference to the fact that we thought um, the law already required the model or the body um, camera policy. So I wondered if that could be put in with the conditions of being eligible for grants in addition to putting the data in is adopted an approved body cam policy because body cameras without policy don't do us any good. So I don't know, Bryn, if that suffices from what we passed a few years ago to count it as something we've asked law enforcement to do already. So what the requirement of that bill was that the law enforcement advisory board establish, um, come up with a model policy on use of body cameras and report back to the legislature with uh, recommendations on um, legislative action that should be taken on those. Okay. So there exists a model policy and this is what I'll send to the committee as soon as I can, um, a link to the model policy. Um, but there was not a require, there ex currently is not a requirement um, that that law enforcement agencies adopt that policy. And that is what the Senate Government Operations Committee is working on now. Um, Thank you. 
my other question is this, when you talked about um, having the first, sorry, I'm trying to remember which bill it's in. So law enforcement had asked about um, locally sanctioning an officer first before it went up to the council, right? For the first front, for the first offense. That is my understanding of the history of that of that statute, that 20, I think it's 2307 in Title 20. Yes, that's my understanding of the history of that existing law. So what if law enforcement didn't give, would it still be eligible to go up to the council or it only is if a sanction was given? Will you say that again? If it's a first offense, did you say? Right. And so the local law enforcement agency chooses to just not um, give any kind of written sanction. What ha what happens at that point, or what can happen? Can it go up? Can it go up to the council for them to decide what if they think there still needs to be a licensure? No, my, my understanding is that if it's a first offense, it's up to the agency to deal with that complaint. Um, and it does not go to the council, except for as the bill provides, there's an exception to that rule for the new two types of category B conduct. But as, it, as current law stands right now for that category B conduct, it is for the agency to discipline that officer. It's up to the agency and it doesn't go to the council. So if they don't discipline the officer and then there's another one, is it considered a first offense because the first one wasn't written up and connected no. that? No, my understanding is that after there, there is a record of the first offense and the second offense has to go to the council. Even if they, if the local law enforcement didn't take action, there's still going to be a record of it. That is my understanding. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ken, and, um, I think I'm forgetting somebody else. I don't see any hands up anymore, but, uh, I think Rob LeClaire, maybe, did you have your hand up before? I did have my hand up, Madam Chair, but I got my question answered. Thank you. Okay, great. And Ken? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So I don't see any hands. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Bryn. So that concludes the um, S219. We've got the effective date section, which I think I, I mentioned as we went through um, that that contingent, that grant funding being contingent on law enforcement agencies reporting their data takes effect in January. Um, and the requirement that VSP be equipped with um, body cameras takes effect on August 1st of this year and the rest of the bill takes effect on passage. And then the title of the bill is, is renamed. Um, but that's it for S219. Okay, great, thank you, Bryn. So Bryn, Will you be able to join us uh, during our noon to two? Yes. All right, great, okay. All right, so why don't we let Bryn go. Bryn, thank you so much, really. Thank you, I'm sorry that I have to leave no. before you're done. Absolutely, no, we appreciate thank you, Brad. that. Yeah, thank you. All right, so committee, I'm going to change what I said, <laughs> given, um, given that we don't have uh, Bryn to do a walkthrough of the other bill and um, in the, 15 minutes that we have, I'm hoping that we can take some testimony um, on this bill. And uh, the commissioner, DPS commissioner is here. Uh, it'd be great to start with you, please. I'm gonna, uh... Commissioner Sherling, are you, I see you here. Just give them a minute. I am here, Madam okay. Chair. Just have Wonderful. to punch a bunch of buttons to make it work. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, did you want me to start in any particular place? There is an enormous amount of uh, ground to cover. I know there is, yeah. So, uh, no, I just, if you're, we'd appreciate your comments on on S uh, 
219 and then hopefully you'll be able to join us at, at noon. I know it's not the most optimal way of doing it, but at least we could we could start the conversation. Uh, I will not be on at noon. We have a uh, COVID. Um, well, actually, I may be on at noon, um, okay. but okay. but only briefly. Um, okay. yeah, we're meeting from uh, noon to two. So anyway, uh, uh, in any event, um, okay. I guess uh, let me start with 219 and go. Uh, I also have some notes on some of the questions the committee had. Uh, That'd be great. Um, Okay, uh, so section one um, grants and reporting, um, no issues there. Uh, I would only flag for the committee, you know, we've suggested in our uh, collective 10 point uh, strategy that uh, this policy should go further. Um, that you know, the, the number of grants the state gives to, to local law enforcement agencies is fairly limited. Um, so I'll just flag that uh, for the committee. Um, collecting data on uh, the use of force in stops. Um, again, I, we're going to go qu quite a bit further beyond what's memorialized here in statute uh, with uh, a new, uh, what hopefully will become a statewide data collection system uh, to collect use of force data on all encounters, not just traffic stops. Um, so no issues there. Um, the physical force definition, I would suggest a more simplistic approach um, in the best policies out there. Uh, force is generally defined as something beyond, uh, any force beyond compliant handcuffing. Um, so that would catch a wider range of things um, and not allow for uh, any anything to fall between the cracks. I think it's overdefined uh, in paragraph five. There was a question in race data collection around probable cause and collecting data around that. Um, the reason that's not collected in race data collection is because it's qualitative, not quantitative. There is no way to check a box and measure uh, the types of, of uh, probable cause because it's dependent on facts and circumstances that change with the encounter. So that's why it's not collected. Uh, in section four, uh, no issues with um, the types of things that would go to be reported to the council, I do wanna raise one very large red flag in the definition of a prohibited restraint. Um, it is not, there is no carve out for a circumstance where lethal force would be warranted. So when we teach lethal force under the constitutional standard, if you are in a, um, a fight for your life, uh, or you're trying to defend someone else. I actually recall back, uh, th these things are so infrequent that uh, you have to go back a ways to get certain examples. But if you go back 25 or 30 years, we had a man wielding a, a knife on the marketplace in Burlington. And uh, based on the, the environment we were in, using a firearm was not possible. So we had officers assigned that if they could get close enough, lethal force was authorized using different kinds of methodologies like batons, or if you could actually get close enough to them, uh, a neck restraint um, in that particular circumstance would be a valid tactic. So we would strongly suggest that these things are prohibited in any instance where lethal force is not an appropriate uh, level of force, but you have to have that carve out because the way it's written now, um, you could use a firearm against someone or you could hit them with a car, uh, but you couldn't use a neck restraint. And uh, so it's incongruous with the operating environment. Um, so that carve out I think is, is essential um, to make this uh, a functional uh, section. Uh, excuse me, so I see uh, Martin, you have a question. 
Yeah, I, I actually wanted to back up, although what, what this conversation is pretty critical, it seems as well. But so I'll ask a question about that first, and then I have a question about uh, section three. So, so how did, did you have language that you would be proposing for that, uh, Commissioner? Uh, in I'm sorry, which section for, for the pro, for the prohibited restraint? What you were just talking about the 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 carve out? Uh, I think it just needs to say something along the lines of unless lethal force is appropriate. Okay. All right, so just backing up to, to section three, uh, you talked a little bit about probable cause and such and checking a box, but don't, don't, doesn't the uh, law enforcement officer have to explain the reason for the stop and would that encompass the probable cause possibly or? Uh, it's reasonable grounds to, to make a stop, um, not probable okay. cause threshold. Okay, okay. Um, so it's a different threshold for subsection B, the reason for the stop? Yes, and the reason for the stop can be briefly articulated with a checkbox. So a moving violation, a non-moving violation, a, uh, a, a third party report of erratic driving, uh, a stop for investigative reasons, uh, you know, the car was suspected of just doing a drug deal. Um, it was suspected of being involved in a burglary three blocks away. Uh, so doing a quantitative analysis using uh, a multi-select kind of scenario is, uh, is what is set up now to articulate what probable cause led to a search. The, the nuances of that is not possible to do using checkboxes in a quantitative analysis. It would be a qualitative uh, type of explanation. Okay, I understand that. All right. So the one other question I had was uh, <clears throat> the meaning of effectuating the stop and, and whether we need to, it sounds like law enforcement understands that that includes the entire uh, stop, not just getting the person pulled over, but whether we should have something a little more, a little clearer, like effectuating or during the stop. I would submit that effectuating is a jargony term that doesn't shouldn't exist anymore. It's just the reason for the stop. Okay, so it sounds like we should maybe add some non jargony clarifying language there. All right. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the more that whether it's policy or statute relies less on jargon and more on simple English is better. All right, thank you. Okay, yeah, I'm not seeing any hands, so you can continue, please. Uh, in section five, uh, we create a new crime. Um, this already exists. It's called aggravated assault. Um, if you do something illegal and cause uh, death or serious bodily injury to someone, um, it's aggravated assault or it's murder. Um, there, this is a duplicate. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what its point is other than to make a statement. Um, and so I would urge the General Assembly to shy away from making a statement, especially as it relates to responding to something that did not happen in Vermont. Um, this just strikes me as uh, over politicizing an issue that we really need to focus on and, uh, and driving a wedge versus um, being productive. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, Video equipment, um, as I've testified previously, uh, it's unnecessary as we're on the precipice of signing a contract. It actually may have deleterious effects on our ability to negotiate with a vendor or vendors, um, kind of boxes us in. Um, so I would suggest uh, striking it, um, but at the same time, it doesn't other than potentially costing the taxpayers more money, it, there's no downside um, to specifying that uh, we deploy these in the state police. Um, relative to policy, uh, I think there's a lot more work that needs to happen. And I would not suggest codifying when cameras are used. I'll just give you a couple of examples. A, as it's currently written, um, there's a direct conflict with constitutional law, both in uh, at a federal level and in Vermont, and when we're allowed to uh, record people without their permission. Um, 
two officers find themselves in places like public restrooms. I don't know that Vermonters want cameras on in public restrooms when we're in there. Uh, so a, again, this is, a, I go back to some of my testimony a, a week or so ago, um, that directing the implementation of best practice is the right balance here, not specifically articulating what the policy should be. Uh, not only because you can, the policy has to evolve uh, sometimes on a weekly basis, we're making modifications as best practice evolves. And as we learn more, not only from what's happening here in Vermont, but on a, on a national, uh, nationally, um, but because there are unintended consequences like conflicts with uh, the judiciary and, and some of the uh, things that they've laid out in terms of uh, privacy considerations. Um, and then there are, are unanticipated uh, things like walking into public restrooms that uh, you, in, a, in a rush to try to get something out the door, we will not be able to vet thoroughly. Um, um, Commissioner, can Okay, can you please talk more about the conflicts with, with federal law and constitutional law? Sure. Uh, one example, uh, we can't enter a house in Vermont without uh, and record without getting permission from the people who are there. Um, so we have to say, do you, is it okay if we record this when we come inside? And so well, let's create a scenario. It's, it's today, it's 94 degrees, or it's January and it's 12 below zero. And you're trying to speak with a um, well, doesn't matter. I guess, I guess uh, let's pick a domestic violence victim, and um, you need to go in the house. And they say, "No, I don't want you to record." Well, now you've got a statutory overlay that says you have to record, and you've got a case law overlay that says you're not allowed to record if you go into their house because they have a constitutionally protected area that uh, that would be an illegal search. So. That's one example. There are a number of others. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Tom, Representative Burdett. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, uh, I'm gonna assume that if there's a, uh, a warrant, you can probably record or would it have to be specifically spelled out in a warrant that it may happen, that it could happen or will happen? Uh, we would normally put that we would write that into a search warrant to record uh, and take photographs uh, inside a property. But if there's someone there when we execute that search warrant uh, and we're wearing a camera, we still have to comply with uh, getting consent to record them inside. Huh. OK. I, I, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> There's a pesky couple of constitutions in play that give us the parameters around which we uh, we operate in the overwhelming number of circumstances. Yeah, we've said that many times in, in this committee, that pesky constitution, but, uh, you know, it, it's uh, in place for a reason, so. Uh, Martin. I think uh, Celine was uh, before me. Uh... I'm sorry. Selena? order. Um, but my question is about body cameras. I've just been reading a lot about the case for and against body cameras through a lot of different lenses. And this um, statutory provision aside, Commissioner, I'm wondering if you could talk more about the, goal, the, the goals um, that you have for the implementation of using body cameras that you said is already in the work. Yeah, so to clarify where we're at, we're in uh, final negotiations with a selected vendor uh, now um, and funding is in place. Uh, the, you know, body cameras are not a panacea. There, there is no panacea to what happens on the street. And I, actually I should take this opportunity. I keep neglecting to do this because there's so much to cover. For anyone who has not spent a shift in a police car somewhere in Vermont, I cannot urge you strongly enough to go do that, um, particularly in places where the call volume 
is more substantial in our small uh, cities and some of our larger towns. Um, it is essential to see how things operate on the street and the scope and depth of the challenges that Vermont faces um, as you're making these kinds of policy choices. So with that said, um, cameras are not a panacea. They are one tool that helps to create transparency, in some cases, clarity, uh, in other cases, not as much. Um, you've all seen body camera video that's shaky and out of whack or the camera's on the ground while uh, the officer is not or the officer's on the ground and the camera's in the air, one or the other. Um, it is just one more contemporary tool uh, to create transparency in the most visible arm of government operations, which is policing. Um, and it's, it supplements um, other video, which you know, in more urban areas is more common, but um, it is incredibly common to have uh, video of uh, law enforcement operations that's taken by third parties or surveillance cameras, um, historically dash cameras, um, and now increasingly uh, body cameras. So um, I, I think that's the, best, uh, that's the best description. Is it going to solve any one problem in its entirety? No. Is it gonna create additional challenges? Yes, uh, including the privacy challenges that, uh, that we're talking about today. Um, but I do believe that we're, we're at a stage, I, uh, we're at a stage where uh, cameras are like uh, any other critical tool um, that police officers carry on a day-to-day -day basis. It's something that we're not too far away from officers saying, hey, I'm not comfortable going out on the street because my camera's broken or um, my camera battery is, uh, is dead or something along those lines. It's just, it's an, it's an essential piece of 20, 21st century uh, policing and transparency. Um, if I could just ask a really quick follow-up question. So I'm really hearing you talk primarily about the goal of transparency um, and which I'm, which I'm happy to hear, but I think there's also some research I'm seeing that says that body cameras may, in some instances, actually increase um, arrests, prosecution, and guilty pleas. And I'm wondering if that, like, do you see this as just another tool for police to also get the job done, or is the or is the goal? Um, for DPS primarily that transparency piece? That's a great question. Um, I don't, I actually think in Vermont, um, my experience has been that we've seen the opposite. Um, you may have clearer evidence on certain kinds of cases and whether that results in more guilty pleas, I, I don't know the answer to. Uh, but in many instances, it actually deescalates the scenario. People, um, who are not influenced by some other force um, like substances or, uh, or something else, um, often, not unilaterally, but often will deescalate when they know they're being recorded um, because they don't want that captured and, and uh, plastered all over the news or social media. And to be so, clear, the data I was looking at was not, it was not localized data. It was from like actually international studies even, I think. So. Yeah, and the, 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 those studies continue to come. Um, and uh, I haven't looked at a use of force study with body cameras deployed uh, recently, but the, the most recent ones I'm aware of that are a, a couple of years old showed uh, dramatic decreases in the amount of force used. Um, and in large part, when you then go back and unpack the, um, you can actually go go into, um, because Vermont is so small, when you look at that, you can look at who force is used on. And I, I know it's gonna surprise you to find out that sometimes it's the same people over and over again and repeated encounters. But sometimes those folks, uh, the amount of times that force is necessary decreases because of body cameras and the fact that they're being recorded and they become a little less uh, combative or belligerent as a result. So um, that's a piece of the puzzle. I think there's an oversight component for police officers. That's a piece of that puzzle as well. Um, but by and large, I think the, the, the national experience with cameras has been 
has been positive, not uncomplicated, uh, but generally positive. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, your hand is down now. Is there, was your question answered? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, and uh, Nader. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Quick question, I, and I apologize if you've already touched on this, but um, regarding section six, can you talk about the cost of storage? Because I know that that um, is something that's been brought up in the past. And right now, with the way it's written being rather broad and basically recording almost everything that the officer is doing, um, would storage and the cost of storage become an issue? It could. That's a great question. Um, the cost of storage has come down exponentially. Um, the cost of units has come down exponentially. Um, but it, they're still expensive and, and the, the ongoing uh, software as a service and cloud storage is the bulk of the cost. Uh, I would have to go back to our numbers uh, and the estimates that we put into uh, our negotiations uh, to see whether there's an impact. I, there is an impact, the question is how much. Uh, but again, um, as a piece of policy, uh, I don't think that that is gonna work. Um, it, it, as I mentioned, there are conflicts in a variety of places. So again, I, I would urge the, the General Assembly to direct the implementation of best, uh, best practice policy, but not to go line by line and, and say what that policy is. Um, it would be stale as, well, the draft you have would be stale immediately. Uh, any draft that you might try to create in its wake would likely be stale within a few weeks because we're constantly changing the key policies to stay current. Thank you. Great, thank you. I, I'm seeing any other hands. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Anything else, Commissioner? On 219. Yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, Senate amendment to see if there's, uh, I think it's, it's more intent than anything. Um, I think I've addressed uh, most of it and I'm going through the questions. I think I got most, uh, all the questions I wrote down uh, while the committee was talking, I think I addressed. Okay, I do see a hand up, Ken, and then committee members, I'll ask you before we adjourn to go to the floor if you, if you do have any other questions. Ken. Good morning, Commissioner, thank you. Um, this bill, are we making it uh, so difficult uh, that law enforcement is putting their lives more at risk? Um, there are some components of some other bills that you're looking at that I do fear are going to create uh, potentially decades of confusion as uh, we wait for case law to evolve, um, particularly with the, the creation of a statutory overlay for uh, the use of force. Um, so I'm happy to get back into that a little bit further. Um, you know, I'd stop short of saying it, it's going to put people's lives at risk. I think it will put, um, it'll put a lot of different things uh, at risk and at, uh, and with more question marks, I guess, than the known risk, because it's really difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, there are many areas where we've got to make immediate progress. And the last few weeks have provided an opportunity to accelerate that progress and modernization that we've been talking about um, for years and have uh, e even put a variety of strategies on the table in January for consideration. Um, so important to balance, uh, you know, there's a few fragments, I think, that have been floated that are are frankly more political than they are operational. They're not really gonna do much for Vermont. Their response to things that are happening in other places in the country. And while I understand the desire to respond to those things, there are many things we can do here in Vermont, including uh, the 10 points that we've put forward in addition to the, uh, the modernization strategy that we talk, started talking about in January, all of those things uh, many of which go way beyond what's being discussed in legislation are things we need to act on now, not let this moment pass. So uh, that I know that doesn't answer uh, your question directly, but it's a long way of saying, you know, I think there's a few things that are on a page right now that are 
either unnecessary or potentially hazardous, but there are more things that aren't on the page that we've got to do. So I go back to um, my suggestion, which is the, the power of this body is to direct us to make progress in certain areas. You don't always have to spell out exactly how that progress needs to be made, but put a timeline on it and not only tie it to grants, but I would say tie it to any state support for your operations at all. No academy, no training, no, basically we're just gonna neuter your ability to operate if you don't comply with best practice in these 10 key areas and potentially beyond that. So, um, so, so I wanna be perfectly clear a couple things. I think, I think um, um, first of all, I like your 10 points that, that you brought up. I, I think that's critical. One of my biggest concerns about this whole thing is by you, by, by legislators not letting or putting more restrictions which some need to be, I, don't misunderstand me, but I feel that we could be putting more innocent people, bystanders, whatever, at risk because there could be more of an altercation of, uh, of, of different things happening. That's one of my big concerns. I think you've already touched on it that um, people are going to resist arrest. They're resisting more arrest all the time now uh, when the an anxiety and stuff takes over the body, people do crazy, crazy things. And um, that's a concern that I have. And, 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 and a question I just really want to ask, because I know everybody's for time, but are we rushing a lot of this legislation too fast? I, I think there's a couple pieces that are rushing in response to wanting to be on the map um, of you know whatever national publication says these states did X. And I wanna be really clear, we are firmly in the camp of uh, embracing oversight, embracing more restrictions really on, or, or more uh, parameters around how law enforcement operates on a national scale and to the extent necessary in Vermont. Um, it's how you do that. We've got to find the best mechanisms to do that. It's not a question of whether you do it. Um, it's how you do it. And I, again, I think there is a framework for doing this that um, can yield really positive results for Vermont uh, and with, without creating uncertainty. And I think there's a couple of areas uh, that are, again, we haven't really gotten to yet um, with the exception of this uh, new criminal penalty um, specific to law enforcement, which is is just it's just not necessary. It's called aggravated assault. It's been on the books for decades. Um, but there are a couple of others that uh, that are not ready, in my opinion, not ready for prime time and are going to create more ambiguity and confusion, uh, potentially again for decades while courts try to figure out what certain words mean um, than we have now, which is a very well constructed, uh, constitutional standard for the use of force. It's how we create policy from that is the area of opportunity that we've got. And I think the General Assembly is in a place where um, you could direct that and create more strings tied to that that would really be meaningful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Martin. Yeah, real quick, uh, if you, uh, Commissioner, if you could send the, that your 10 point plan, I guess we call it, to, to our committee assistant so we could have it posted. Uh, to, that would be appreciated. Certainly. Uh, which assistant? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, to, to Mike Bailey. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on that, I would say both because I saw uh, Representative Copeland Hansa shaking her head yes. Yeah, yeah all right, both. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Andrea Hussey can put it up on the GovOps committee page as well. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Any other questions? And when I say committee, I mean both committees. We're one committee for now, right now. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. Sarah, anything you'd like to add or? I want to thank the commissioner for being with us and and urge you to um, to send someone who can 
help us uh, again this afternoon. Uh, we're, our agendas are evolving rapidly as we adapt to when Legislative Council is available. And we do have two bills that we're trying to get through uh, here today and tomorrow. So we would really appreciate having, uh, having your participation in all of these conversations. So thank you. Great, and I'd like to echo that as well. Um, and to uh, folks who are, are quite, you know, so to speak, in the room um, who are going to testify, I'm sorry we we didn't get to you, um, but hope we will uh, this afternoon. And I think it's helpful for everybody to hear the questions and and testimony uh, moving moving forward. So thank you, everybody, and uh, appreciate your flexibility and. Uh, staying, staying here, and and uh, I know we are on the floor, so I will uh, adjourn, and we will go off record.